Do you really need rest days? If you're serious about becoming a faster, stronger runner, the answer might surprise you. We damage ourselves with every run we do. And when we recover, our body repairs that damage and makes small improvements so it can handle the same stress better the next time. That's how we get fitter, stronger, and faster. Relentlessly chasing your next PB can lead to overtraining, whether you're a beginner or an elite runner. But perhaps we've been looking at this all wrong. Instead of overtraining, should we be flipping it and calling it under recovery? Because we're not letting our body fully repair and bounce back stronger. For those of you that are new here, I'm Russ, a 243 marathon runner at the second attempt, and hopefully soon to be a 239 marathoner. Follow me along on Strava to see how my training's going as I gear up for the Gold Coast Marathon in July. So by the end of this video, you'll understand what we're trying to achieve with rest, how to spot signs of fatigue, and how often and how to rest to the max. I'm gonna break down some of the science so that you'll know exactly how and why rest and recovery is your secret weapon to better performance, and also how to utilize it to the max to get that PB without burning out or becoming injured. So let's get into it. Understanding recovery and stress. So what is it that we're actually recovering from? Now in the science world, there's a term called allostatic load. Essentially, that's the buildup of stress and fatigue, both physically and mentally. So when we talk about recovery, we can't just think about sore legs or tired muscles. We've got to balance that mental stress from home, work, relationships, because they all contribute. So a good example is, have you ever finished a long drive and felt totally exhausted, even though you've barely moved? Well, that's that mental fatigue building up and that's adding to your allostatic load. And the problem is, is that our body doesn't differentiate between those two stresses. So whether it's a long tempo run or a tough day at work, your nervous system just logs it all down as stress. And that's why managing overall life stress is just as important as nailing your training plan. So what are we trying to achieve with rest? Okay, so let's zoom out completely. What's the actual point of a rest day? Well, the first thing is repair and adapt. So running causes these little micro tears in our muscle fibers, and the rest allows that time for them to repair, which leads to stronger and more resilient muscles. And it also helps those little connective tissues like your tendons and your ligaments to recover, and that will stop those from getting little niggles as well. The next thing it does is regulates our hormones. So regular full rest actually helps reduce cortisol levels, so stress levels, and it allows things like our testosterone and other key hormones to bounce back, which have been suppressed because of our training. The next thing you can do is it helps reduce stress. So those intense or longer efforts can really stress the nervous system, especially during like high volume and high intensity training blocks. So that rest restores that mental sharpness, coordination, and importantly, it gives you that motivation to get back out there the next time. Now, another more physical thing is it actually helps restore our energy system. So when you're using your muscles, your glycogen stores reduce, and this gives them the time to refill. Also, your immune system catches up. You're able to put your muscles through their whole repair cycle as well. So without taking that appropriate amount of time to rest, you're just going to continue to spiral and spiral. So a question I get asked a lot is, do elite runners train every day? And this is where the science gets a little bit fuzzy, but the short answer is no. So even the pros don't train every single day of the year. Well, why? Well, because skipping that rest leads us to that spiral, burns us out, increases the chances of us getting injured, and also it can lead to stagnation of our performance if we're not able to improve. A good way to think of it is instead of just thinking about training as just the running part, Think about it as stress plus recovery equals adaptation. So without the recovery part of the equation, you're just piling on stress with minimal to no actual benefits and improvements. And that's why top athletes schedule rest the same way they schedule their key sessions. They build their week around it and that should tell you everything. Studies have found though that there's no one size fits all for rest at that elite level. So some elites might take a full day off weekly, Others use these deload weeks every few cycles. But here's the key, their job is to train. They have time to nap, eat perfectly, and use optimal recovery tools, so much so that they put in just as much effort to their recovery as they do with their training. 
Whereas you and I, we've got work, kids, chores, studies, stress that they don't have to deal with. So comparing your schedule to theirs is so unrealistic, which means that if they're doing it, you should be doing it too. All right, so the next logical question is, how do you know that you're fatigued? But before we jump into that, please can I ask that if you like, subscribe, and follow me on Strava as well if you're finding this useful. Our community is growing quicker and quicker by the day, so please let me know in the comments any hacks that you've found to help speed up your recovery, because I'm all ears. Okay, so back into it. Now, fatigue can sneak up on you or it can just flat out smack you in the face. But there are some small telltale signs to watch out for that can be a really good indicator that you're just not resting enough. And the first one is persistent tiredness. So even with good sleep, as a runner, you should be getting a minimum of seven to nine hours a night anyway. But if you're still feeling sluggish after getting some pretty good sleep, it's a sign that your body isn't bouncing back properly. Sleep should refresh you, and if it doesn't, you may be in a bit of a hole. Now, the next one may seem counterintuitive, but it's actually struggling to fall asleep. And what can happen is that high cortisol can make it really difficult to fall asleep and switch off at night. And ironically, overtraining can cause insomnia and not extra sleepiness. So if it's taking you longer than 10 to 15 minutes to fall asleep once your head hits that pillow, you should be taking note. Now, the next is having a low appetite despite this heavy training. So normally hard training ramps up your hunger levels. So if you're skipping meals and you're not getting that urge to eat, it could be a sign that something's signaling to you. Also, chronically elevated stress, that will really suppress your appetite. So if you're struggling to hit your calorie balance and perhaps you're losing quite a lot of weight, that could be a good indicator. Now, the next is a loss of libido or changes in the menstrual cycle. And, and these are really key signs of a hormonal imbalance. So what can happen is your body basically starts diverting resources away from its reproductive system to deal with that stress. So it's essentially your system saying, not now, we're in survival mode, we've got a flight or fight situation going on. Now the next, I really struggle with myself and that's struggling to focus. Brain fog is real. And if you find yourself zoning out during meetings, forgetting things, losing concentration mid-run, your mental bandwidth might be depleted and it's definitely time to take a rest. The next is that hard workouts feel harder. So you know that feeling when paces that you normally hit suddenly feel like it's a real grind? Now that's definitely a red flag because your muscles and your nervous system are probably fatigued. Now it's natural not to feel super fresh during a block of intensive training, but if you're feeling like you're getting slower, then you could be overdoing it. Aches, pains, or signs of injury creeping in, they're signs of overuse injuries and they rarely pop up out of nowhere. Now they're the end result of weeks and sometimes months of unaddressed fatigue and stress. So think of like tight calves, sore Achilles, niggling knees, don't just ignore them. Yes, it could be that you've tweaked something, but a trip to the physio will always help that. But if you're consistently getting injured or having issues like that consistently, that's another sign to wind it back a bit. Now the next is a bit more technical and it's a drop in your heart rate variability and an increase in your rest and heart rate. So your heart rate variability, that's a really good proxy for your recovery. And when it drops consistently, that's your nervous system telling you that it's under pressure. But also if your rest and heart rate rises by more than five to 10 beats a minute from your normal baseline overnight, that's another sign that it's time to rest. Actually, a study on elite Nordic skiers found that their heart rate variability dropped and heart rate rose during periods of real intense fatigue. Now, most of us have got smartwatches these days and your smartwatch is clever enough to calculate your chronic, which is your longer term, and your acute, which is your shorter term training loads. And they use data points like your exercise duration, intensity, and frequency. And then they will crunch your heart rate variability, rest and heart rate and other sleep data to give you an overall training status. And that can help to indicate whether you're straining yourself or not. Now, in my experience, these have been pretty good indicators, but listening to your body on the other points that I mentioned definitely trumps what your smartwatch is telling you. So I hear you say, Russ, I've got a couple of red flags. What do I actually need to do on my rest day? Okay, so let's clear up some common confusion. There's actually two ways to recover. There's what we call active recovery, 
which is light movement like walking the dog, stretching or gentle swimming. Now, they're great for days when you've already trained pretty hard and you want to keep that blood flowing because it can really help with muscle soreness and circulation. Now, a good example, I'll give you one. Uh, this morning, I've done a pretty heavy tempo session. So this evening, I'm going to take a 30 minute easy walk just to help flush the legs out and aid that recovery. But it's important to make sure that it's not going to add any extra stress to your day. So I'm not going to try and wedge it in between dinner and something else that will add any extra stress to my life. But when we talk about actual rest days, we're talking about passive recovery, which is total rest. So this is your full day off. No runs, no cross training, no secret cardio. And 99% of coaches will recommend at least one full rest day per week. And this is something that I actually apply myself and I take it really seriously in my own marathon training blocks. But let me be clear though. So even things that sound like rest, like a gentle swim, they can still be really mentally demanding. You might have to set your alarm, pack your bag, drive to the pool, wait for a lane, clean up after. It's not just that physical act of swimming that's the problem. It's the, all those mental overheads that contribute to it as well. So unless it's something super simple and that you can easily flow it into part of your day, just forget about it. It's important to remember that training itself has admin. Logistics, scheduling, compromising with your family and squeezing sessions around work. All of that contributes to your cognitive load. So give your brain a break, let yourself sleep in, skip the morning rush, or just take a proper lunch break and catch up with some friends. It will make a huge difference. So how do you rest to the max? Now on your full passive rest day, you wanna be focusing on things like eating well. So having a nutrient rich meal that supports muscle repair. You wanna be prioritizing protein, complex carbs, healthy fats. Now, if I'm not in bed or on the sofa on my rest day, you can find me with my head in the fridge but try and keep it healthy. Tubs of ice cream aren't gonna give you the same benefits as a balanced meal. The next is hydration. So it's easy to forget water when you're not actually running, but hydration can support recovery just as much as your nutrition. You wanna make sure that your pee is pretty clear and it's not nuclear. Now, the next one's a real simple one and that's sleeping more. A nap or sleeping in an extra hour can work wonders. And the more sleep you can get, the better. Then it's about relaxing mentally. So watch a film, read, meditate, do something that isn't performance driven and try and schedule your work and life so that you're not putting yourself under a massive load of stress. So there are some physical things that you can do on your rest day, like a massage, a very light stretch or some foam rolling. And that gentle bodywork can support blood flow and reduce that tightness. But providing that it's not turning into some form of workout. So something very, very light can be useful. Now, people talk about sauna and steam rooms, and I think that they're a great tool for active recovery, but not on passive recovery days, as it mimics some of that cardiovascular work that you typically get from doing an easy training run. Remember, we're trying to calm everything down and not add any fuel to the fire. And these things can elevate the heart rate so much so that some sauna sessions can actually turn into a zone two workout. People ask me all the time about ice baths. Now, the science on this is a bit controversial. After a race or a really big effort, they can help reduce muscle soreness, but during the hard training block, they may suppress your inflammation response that you need to adapt. So there was a study that was in 2015 that found that ice baths could actually reduce long-term strength gains. So I'd use them very strategically, more so after a race where you plan on having some time off anyway, but not as a way of managing your recovery regularly. If you're training three to four days a week, unless you're doing some absolutely huge sessions every time you go out, you're likely getting enough accumulated rest on your rest days to not have to focus as hard on complete recovery. If you're doing five or six sessions like me, then you really wanna be putting in some focus on how it is that you can incorporate everything that we've gone through into your dedicated rest day. Rest is a part of your training. It's not being lazy, it's being smart. And it's about doing what your body needs to do to come back stronger. And I get it, it can be difficult if your Strava's blowing up, you've got friends that are doing sessions and getting longer running streaks than you, but I guarantee that in the longer term and over the years, you'll be the one that will be able to stack block after block after block on top of each other without breaking down 
and that will allow you to consistently push yourself forward. Whereas they'll be having to take big chunks of time off training, they'll get injured, and it will become too much mentally, and you'll see that you're making much more gains than they ever will. So train hard, yes, but rest smart. Learn to listen to your body because when you do, everything like speed, endurance, strength, it all falls into place. Learning how to structure your week so that you can fit in a rest day or figuring out after which sessions is best to take them on can be quite difficult. But luckily for you, I've got plenty more content which can help you with your training right here. And if you've made it this far, you'll already have got plenty of value out of this video. So please make sure you like and subscribe. Ta-ra!